climate action. So please be sure to watch all three episodes of our series. Um, watch the first one and the second one. And the third one. Okay, it hasn't come out, but also watch the third one. And um, of course, you are watching us now. And I'd just like to tell the people watching online on Facebook and on YouTube, please engage with us. Send in your comments, send in your questions. Hashtag get away. And of course, I'll be selecting the best questions. No pressure. <laughs> Hashtag. And of course, I'll ask the audience to engage with questions and we shall continue. So. I want to hear more voices about your thoughts about climate change. Is anyone else keen? This is your chance to be famous. <laughs> this is your chance to be famous. This guy said we'll be on TV. <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but I mean, can I pick a face? You want to go? Tell us your thoughts about climate change. Actually, what do you do to combat climate change? Be honest. If you don't, it's fine. No pressure. <laughs> What was the question again? So my, <laughs> so my question is, what is your role? What role do you play in fighting climate change? Do you throw litter in the bin? Do you recycle things? What do you do if you do anything? Okay, um, my role um, in preventing climate change is to um, litter in the correct bin and also um, to tell the other person not to um, to use the correct bin and also um, fighting um, as a whole of um, everyone to fight climate change, but we believe that um, climate don't change, but system change. Wow, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. I might just move you into the, the <laughs> guest. Do you, you want to be the guest? Maybe you should come and join. I can't <laughs> like, like, no. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, so, of course, here we have our guest, the experts. That was very phenomenal, <laughs> but sorry. <laughs> we have the actual people. So to my left is Ayaka Militafa. She's a 17-year-old climate change activist. And of course, on my far right is Tatenda, who's an environmental lawyer. And we've got our very own. Aman Babulal. First of all, I like saying his surname. Babulal, can I say it again? Go for this. <laughs> Knock yourself um, out. And today they'll be talking, of course, about all things climate change. Um, and, you know, it's great to see young people. I know when we went to our climate strike, um, I met Ayaka and she was very passionate and she had so much to say. And I'm interested to know how much she I know you guys will be blown away because I was. I know when I was 17, I didn't know about renewable energy and all these biodegradable words that she uses. So I was very, very, very um, excited about that. So, Aman, what yes. can we expect today from the audience and yourself? Well, um, I'd say much like climate change, I have a very good idea of what's about to happen. Uh, mm. uh, unlike climate change, it should be pretty good. Mm. Yeah, mm. that's, that's wow. what I was, yeah. Wow, yeah. do you practice that? <laughs> every, night, every night in front of the mirror. <laughs> okay, of okay, I can tell, I can yeah, tell. Um, Ayaka, yeah. how does it feel to be on TV? Tell us. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. It feels quite awesome and empowering. I'm just here to make a difference, hopefully, and inspire some people. Wow. Have you ever been on TV? Yes. With you, remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, guys. This is not television. It's YouTube. <laughs> but can you tell us, though, um, just as a starting point, um, your thoughts about climate change and climate action in South Africa? Um, basically, climate change is a big issue and it affects every single person on this earth. It, it's not gender bound, it doesn't see race or color, so it's very important for every single person in South Africa um, to be fighting against this because it's very important for us as the youth to show them that we are serious about climate change and then we want to make a difference in this earth. And as we said, that we are the future of today, not tomorrow, and it's our duty um, to get the government to hear us out and um, tell us um, what are they doing and implement stuff instead of just talking about it the whole time. Wow. You know, I really like that point where you say we are the future of today and not tomorrow. I read an article on Daily Maverick and they actually said, um, and I think the title of the article was that we, um, we are fighting for today and not necessarily the future because I think that's the problem with climate change. We mm -hmm. always try and think of it as this abstract concept mm -hmm. yeah. that's going to happen in 2050. No, it's now. It's here. Mm -hmm. It's today. We see it around mm -hmm. ourselves. Tatenda, haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're here. So please tell us how you're feeling. How do you feel about being on TV? Uh, it's awesome, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. At this time, but it's not bad. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you'll do fine. You'll do good. Um, 
any, you know, preliminary thoughts about climate action and climate change? Um, I mean, just like what Ayako was saying is happening, we need to be acting now and not wait for other people to do it for us. I mean, it's our chance to do something right now. Wow. First of all, did I tell you that she's an environmental lawyer? <laughs> now, I've heard, yes, who? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, Woman empowerment there. You know, I've heard different kinds of lawyers, but I've never actually met an environmental lawyer. So you are the first one. Shout out to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is not just for my interest sake. Maybe others will be interested. One. Um, one. one. Jimmy, one. one. Did you always want to be an environmental lawyer? Or was it something that you just kind of decided, adversity? <laughs> Actually, I decided when I was 16. Wow, 16. Wow. I wow. started off with an interest in human rights law. I'm from Zimbabwe, so I used to immigrate a lot. And I mean, there's some human rights issues involved in immigration. And that's when I actually wanted to do law. But then I found out about environmental law. And then I realized that I'm a human being. I have a voice. I can speak for myself. So when my rights are violated, I can actually stand up for myself but who stands up for the environment, it's voiceless. So someone mm. needs to be there and mm. actually yeah. do something about it. So that's when I decided I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. Wow. Did you also practice that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jack. No, I felt that was from the heart. I, that, was, that was absolutely phenomenal. I also want to say shout out to the crew, each and every person, to the director, to the producer, and of course, the show of the star. I'm joking. Um, and of course, um, we're about to start our show right now. So behave. I'm joking. Um, continue laughing. Continue being the best person that we're going to start. And of course, um, we are now getting ready for our live stream broadcast. And we will, of course, be having our audience. And of course, I just want to say my best words. Stay woke. <laughs> <laughs> Come on guys. Um, Come on guys. Stay woke. Stay aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to remind you guys to please engage on comments on Facebook. Um, hashtag get aware. Please send in your questions. As I said, I will be selecting questions and we'll be asking it to our guests. As we can see, they have some phenomenal thoughts and they will answer your questions to their best. And of course, to the audience, you can think of a question right now and we'll be asking to our audience. So please don't be shy. Ask any question. Don't troll us, please. Any, please be serious about your questions. So let's get ready. All right. Can you press, can you press play? Go. It's the new YouTube sensation that's making waves across the internet. This channel it's is called Politically YouTube Aware. I have mean, What? I don't, I don't know. What it is. This channel is called Politically Aware. I have mean, What? I don't, I don't know what it is. Gareth Cliff called it cleverer than Cliff Central. I didn't say that. That's bullshit. It's the show that's got the country talking. But what politically aware were? Internationally acclaimed comedian Louis Sogola said late night news will never be the same. <laughs> politically aware. A news kind of show. Politically aware, you can learn while you are. We took a look at Tito Mawini's budget speech. The green thing. Make this thing legal. Shut up, Africa. We are recapping, dissecting, and analyzing the news. South African news, guys. Nonsense, I'm standing up. Zant, show me. Even this video is taking too long. Way faster than you've ever seen. Even this video is taking too long. Stephen, can you cut already? I should probably cut round about now. So I direct and edit. I write. I research. I present. And there are even more of us behind the scenes. Working in two cities across the country. Skype meetings and WhatsApp calls. Hashtag data costs must fall. Zuma must fall. Things must fall. I'm here to listen to what you do and have to say. We can hold the government accountable. <laughs> In our culture. South Africa is not liberated at all. We just have fancy constitution. This is my story. It's being told. Young people get it. Our whole house is on fire, and our adults are carrying on business as usual. Let young people set their agenda. And they can, because everyone wants your vote. Wow. Stay woke. Stay woke. Stay woke. Stay away. 
Australia's first live stream broadcast. Today we are at UCT Live and we have our guests and our live audience who will be engaging with us. And of course, I'm going to introduce to you guys our first guest, Ayaka Militafa, 17-year-old climate activist. And to my far right is Tatenda, an environmental lawyer. And of course, our very own Aman Babulal. And we will be discussing anything about climate action, from climate change to how young people want government to respond to I'm their to demands. It. So please stay with us, stay engaged, comment, and of course we will be bringing everything to you. So now I will give over to Aman to take over the show and lead us on. So stay woke, stay aware. <laughs> Thanks, Zippo, and hi everyone at home. It's been a busy week of climate action all around the world, and South Africa hasn't been an exception. In collaboration with our sponsors, Politically Aware has put together a series of climate change episodes that have brought this global topic back home. Tonight, we're going to engage on some of these issues that we've raised in these episodes with two brilliant guests, our live audience, and hopefully you at home, uh, as we try and deep dive on what we, the youth, can do about climate change in South Africa. My name is Aman Babulal, and I will be Politically Aware's contributor to this discussion. Before we dive in, um, let's have another quick round of introductions, um, just so we know who's who in the room. Uh, we we're fortunate to be with Tatenda Muponde from the Center of Environmental Rights, and Ayaka Melitafa, who is a youth activist. Um, if you guys can tell us a little bit more about yourselves, the institutions that you represent, and, uh, and maybe, again, a little bit of background into what brought you into this space. Tatenda, you can take it away. Hey, um, hi, I'm Tatenda. I'm a candidate at Tony at the Center for Environmental Rights. We are activist lawyers working with communities to help them realize their rights to a healthy environment. And we normally do this through litigation and other advocacy tools. Why I got into this space is because I always feel that the environment always takes a backseat in almost all of our daily conversations and decision-making processes. So I feel that it's time we change something like that and make it mainstream. So in every decision that we make, be it an economic decision, social decision, we should be able to talk about the environment, see how whatever we are doing is going to affect the environment and what we can do about it. If it's something we can avoid, then avoid. If it's something that we can mitigate, then look into mitigation measures. So basically, yeah, that's what I mean. Well, thank you for making us feel bad. Um, I'm <laughs> sure I'm not going to feel much better after I Ayaka tells us her story. But um, what about you, Ayaka? Um, I'm Ayaka Militafa. I'm 17 and I go to the Center of Science and Technology. Um, I'm part of an organization that's called Project 90 by 2030 under the ULEAD initiative, um, which is an organization that strives for low carbon generation by 2030. I'm also part of the African Climate Alliance. I am a spokesperson, also the recruitment official. Yeah, um, the reason why I came into this field was actually after the day zero fiasco. I noticed how much it's affecting people around me, especially um, people in poorer communities, um, people of color in specific. So I got here um, so that I can raise awareness about climate change, also to be the voice of the voiceless and be able to um, voice out our opinions or what we want the government to do um, since we're also citizens of South Africa. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Sayaka. Um, I guess from my side, I, am, I have a much uh, humbler story. Uh, I currently work for a clean tech startup that builds smart energy devices. Uh, and before this, I worked for a nonprofit that used to help clean tech entrepreneurs uh, across Africa. Um, I also helped write the ESCOM hit piece that Politically Aware put out uh, a few months ago, if you may remember. So this is really, uh, I think, from the team, something I'm particularly passionate about. And that's why I was quite uh, keen to lead this discussion today. Um, I guess without further ado, Let's have a look at a few of the highlights from Politically Aware's first climate change episode, and then we can get the conversation started. Scientists say we're on track for 40 degrees of global warming by 2100. What would that look like? So See this map here. That red part covering Africa is so hot it's uninhabitable. And the yellow part covering the whole of Essay. That's our entire country turned into a desert. And only these guys are going to be celebrating. When you consider that scientists are basically telling us the roof, the roof is on fire. Why does it seem like no one is talking about this? 
For starters, a recent report from Afrobarometer found that just 41% of South Africans have heard of climate change, lower than almost all other African countries. And of those who have heard of it, the majority said it doesn't need to be stopped. Wait, what? I'm surrounded by idiots. Okay, so that's not great. But if we aren't aware of climate change, we should be asking ourselves if our media, political parties and government are giving it enough priority. Like in school, for example. The teachers, we, we don't learn about this at all. It's not something they bring up. You're, you're taught to go into society and to work until you could die. What's more, the news cycle is always covering the latest crisis or trend, from sales funding to jobs to hashtag Siamita 2019. But where are all these babies that you guys have committed to making going to live? We get misled to believe that we climate change ain't one. Scientists say we are on track for four degrees awesome, of great. global warming. Um, I guess based on these findings that we found, I think that's what stood out for me, these awareness stats or lack of awareness stats. Um, I basically have to ask myself, Two questions. One, yes, there's an issue with awareness in South Africa. How do we improve this? But secondly, even if we did improve this, how do we make this a priority issue for people? Um, Ayaka, you've done a lot of work, I think, with residents in Kailicha in terms of raising awareness. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've raised this awareness uh, and also how you've managed to uh, balance this against all the other societal issues? Mm. So basically at school I started raising awareness um, through the assembly. I'm just talking to my peers and being able to give in a platform to talk about the organizations that I'm in since they are environmental organizations. People normally see me with this t-shirt and then they just ask me um, what does this mean? Um, how did you get into this? And I kind of use that to actually change the subject and talk about climate change. And I try to make it like a discussion so that I can get the input as well so that it doesn't seem like I'm belittling them and I'm showing them that I know more than you so they can also get um, to them to talk about how it's affecting them so like that's how I'm basically raising awareness even in my community mm. then instead of it they normally see me and they always say Ayaka you're always leaving you're always going somewhere mm. and I say because I'm doing something like you mm. should do something as well because there's so much we can do and mm. everyone deserves to be um, climate literate and know how to voice out their opinions regarding climate change. That, that's that's really great and what I particularly like is getting their thoughts on it. Yeah. I'm not sure if anything comes to mind, but you know, how engaged uh, are the people you, you speak to? What is of interest to them? What are some of those examples? Um, they normally tell me um, why you care about the environment and climate change. We have more pressing issues like violence against women and children, um, gangsterism and xenophobia. But I always tell them that xenophobia, violence against women and children and gangsterism will never end under the current um, issue that is climate crisis. Like you have to go to climate crisis and actually talk about it because like if we are um, struggling with water shortages and also electricity and the prices of food are going up then gangsterism won't end at the end mm -hmm. of the day so it's very important for us um, to focus on social issues like climate change before we actually go to um, violence against women and children and stuff like that because if we stop violence against women and children where are those women going to stay if there's no planet? I think that's a brilliant segue into what I was going to raise next. Um, but I th I'm keen to get more thoughts on this issue. In our first episode that we released, there was actually uh, a YouTuber. Uh, YouTube comments, of course, a source of much wisdom. Uh, <laughs> and the commenter said, I don't know. I feel now that there's m there are more pressing issues than climate change. I don't think this information can help the South African people in our country. Climate change is for the first and second world countries. You need to bring to attention the politics of the country first before we take on the politics of the world. In my opinion, no South African cares about climate change. Um, Tatenda, do you agree with these interesting thoughts? No, I mean, she is South African and mm -hmm. she cares about climate change. But mm -hmm. um, I totally disagree with that kind of thoughts because it sort of assumes that South Africa is immune to climate change. Mm -hmm. And yet what we've seen in the recent years is floods in KZN, droughts around the country, these extreme weather changes that we are suffering from. And you hear someone saying something like this. It's, I think it goes back to the issue of awareness. So mm -hmm. people don't really know why it's important. So it's easy for them to then say, we don't care and try to back out of the conversation mm -hmm. instead of engaging. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, South Africa really has to care mm -hmm. about climate change because we are not immune. We're a developing country. We mm -hmm. use 
and rely a lot on coal, which is carbon intensive, and mm. that escalates climate change on its own. Mm. And so we should care because we are mm. affected. And if you don't do something, we suffer more. Mm. OK, great. Um, I think what I've also noticed is uh, to give to give some uh, fairness to the other side, I think the, the best, most charitable interpretation that I find is that people have very immediate pressing issues. It's very difficult for them to to consider these kind of long longer term issues when they you know they're not seeing it immediately. And I think having this conversation about uh, letting people balance out their concerns in the short term, but also making them aware of long term issues, even if it you know doesn't necessarily become their priority uh, immediately, but just making them aware that there is a long term issue that they should should care about is perhaps the kind of balance we, we're hoping to strike because I don't see people necessarily um, you know, changing their minds about what's uh, important to them uh, today. But th that's, that's how I'm seeing it at the moment. But I think just to close out this, these in intro questions around uh, awareness and uh, how we think the message is being shared, do you have any thoughts about how the climate change narrative is being shared by the media, whether it's enough whether there's uh, already too much, there's too little, or maybe it's too serious or not serious enough. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on the way the narrative is being shared? Um, I definitely think that the media can do more because what we see is that sometimes they sort of deal with climate change in a silo sort of situation. So they sort of isolated from other issues, whereas it's actually intertwined with almost everything that affects us. So it's we it's with it's intertwined with all our economic mm. decisions, mm. all our social social decisions mm. and environmental decisions. Mm. So every time we talk about these things, we need to be able to think about what about climate change? You know, mm. what are the impacts of these decisions on climate change and what can we do about it? And as the media, they do have that power to influence people and make people change their minds mm. around this, educate them, give, th give them more information around mm. climate change. But they're not doing that much. Sometimes they wait until s an incident happens mm. to report on something. Mm. Whereas we are in a situation where it needs to come naturally in our conversations. When you talk about something, mm. it should be something we, we are already thinking about at the back of our minds. So this has happened. What about climate change? You know, naturalize it in all of our conversations and reporting. I, I agree. I think the, this idea of having something that's a systemic issue, but it's currently uh, compartmentalized into different areas makes it too easy for people to opt out of learning about climate change. They see an article, they say it's about climate change. This is boring, not interested, not going to read that. I'm going to read about, say, sports or, I don't know, business mm -hmm. or other things without having this infused into every other issue. Uh, I think that's one of, th one of the issues. And I, I think the other issue for me personally that comes to mind is around um, basically novelty and 24-hour news cycles. So media often just wants to have something hard hitting every day that will capture someone's attention. And unfortunately, climate change, in a sense, moves quite slowly and just gets more serious every day. But there isn't that kind of drama that you'll have in like the political space in South Africa where this politician said this or you know that happened. And I think that kind of soap opera element doesn't exist in climate change. It makes it almost a less sexy um, kind of topic for people to, uh, to pay attention to. And that hasn't, that hasn't helped its case. But if perhaps if the media were to talk about climate change around materiality and importance, instead of you know what's uh, interesting for the day maybe then it, it would get more coverage and, and more mm -hmm. serious coverage mm -hmm. um Ayaka, any any final thoughts on on this yeah i'd like to say that um i do think the media should be doing more um to alert us more about climate change because in the words of greta Thunberg, like we should be panicking right now we should be mm -hmm. acting as if our house is on fire because essentially it is so when the media just talks about it bluntly or bluntly or just for a day or two and then mm -hmm. moves on to another story um, they're not really enforcing um, how serious climate change is. And as you said, um, the youth, um, um, the media is very really powerful in influencing people. So if they can make us more aware about climate change and tell us the importance and report on stories that um, relate to climate change and how much it's affecting us as people, then we'd actually start standing up and acting against climate change. Awesome. I think before we move on, 
I want to get into some of these, the formal mechanisms, the formal processes that we can use on the legal side. But I think a good segue into that will be just having a look at the, the clips on the second episode. So let's, let's see what's happening there. South Africa is not only the biggest carbon polluter in Africa, but it's actually the 14th biggest in the world. Very disappointing. In 2015, per person, we spewed out more carbon than the UK, EU, and even China. So what's causing this? South Africa, being a country rich in coal, made sure to develop powerful coal-driven power companies called Sasol and Eskom. Sasol's coal to liquid plant, Secunda, the single largest point source of carbon dioxide emissions anywhere on Earth. Disgusting. Just these two companies alone pump out more than half of South Africa's entire carbon emissions today. And Sasol alone emits more carbon dioxide than whole countries like Ireland and Portugal. Very bad. Very bad. Very bad. At the end of the day, SA needs to find a way to swipe left on Sasol and other carbon intensive companies who refuse to change. They're just not compatible with the carbon free world South Africa signed up to, promising to cut our carbon emissions in the 2015 Paris Agreement. But that's not likely to happen. While the government keeps saying one thing. We should live up to our Paris Commission. We need to act with greater urgency to the effects of climate change, climate, climate, climate change ravages. But doing the exact opposite. Exploration, expansion, new mines, coal. Coal, 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 coal energy. Now you look like the Minister of Coal. But surely Cyril has a plan, guys. I mean, come on. This is the new dawn, right? Mining in South Africa is indeed a sunrise industry. Oops, wrong clip. I meant this one. On the 8th of March, we will be launching a landmark campaign to mobilize all South Africans. This is something that we would like to undertake on a whole scale basis. It's aimed at changing things such as littering, pick up a broom, a bag, and make South Africa clean. <laughs> wow, uh, anti climax indeed. Um, as much as I'd like to make reference to the make, uh, make South Africa clean again, I'd like to actually go back to the part about Sasol and uh, what corporates are currently doing in the country and whether they're being reined in or not. So Tatenda, could you chat about one or two of the kind of um, lawsuits or other legal action that's been taken by the Center for Environmental Rights? Yeah, sure. Um, at the Center for Environmental Rights, we done quite a lot in trying to hold corporates accountable. Um, one case I can give you is our Tabameti case. Tabameti is a core independent power producer that has been authorized in the Mpumalanga High mm. Vault. And one of the issues in that case was that when they were authorized to build the power plant, they, were, they did not take into account climate change impacts. So as the CR, we intervened, we took up the case and we said, actually, you are required by our environmental laws to take into account climate change impacts when you're doing such a big development that has got huge impacts. I mean, it's a coal-fired power plant. Mm -hmm. It's carbon intensive. You need to know mm -hmm. what are the climate change impacts of this. So actually, it was a successful case because mm -hmm. the court ruled in our favor and actually said you do need to take into account climate change impacts of any development projects that are likely to have an impact on climate change. So it set precedence in that way. So that also means that any other development that's gonna happen and is likely to have an impact on climate change, they will be required mm -hmm. to have a climate change impact assessment. And it has to be comprehensive, not just on surface level, mm -hmm. you know, right. like a comprehensive assessment on how it's going to impact us. And then that will also enable decision makers to make a an informed decision on whether or not they need to authorize this development or not. Right, exactly. And and I think what what's interesting is that it went to court. So did they feel that they were they were innocent or were they ignorant of the processes? So what actually happened is they did do a climate change assessment. Okay. But then it was surface level stuff. Okay. So they did not go into detail. So for example like greenhouse gas emissions, how much mm. of it is going to be 
emitted okay. and you know quantifying it and how it's going to really affect us mm -hmm. so what the court basically said was when you're doing your mm -hmm. climate change impact assessment don't do it at surface level because mm -hmm. this is a huge thing mm -hmm. you know so you gotta be comprehensive mm -hmm. you know we really need to know all the nitty-gritty details mm -hmm. about this it's it's still really telling though that you, you know you were going to bring this legal action against them that it wasn't thorough enough and they didn't feel that it was useful to do this thorough, comprehensive research because that's important information as opposed to yeah. whether or not you have to do it legally. Um, I think that's what's really um, upsetting about, about this, but it's great to hear that you were successful in that. Um, do you find that most, of your, that most of the action that is taken against corporates, does it tend to be successful or do you find that it's often a struggle? Um, it's often a struggle. I mean, mm -hmm. there are successes, but like the Tabernese mm -hmm. one, but mm -hmm. then even now we are still, we do have another Tabernese case. Because right. So it's often a struggle because you're dealing with corporates that are also want to go ahead with this thing yeah. and you're also dealing with the government that is also, there's a lack of political will to also enforce certain things. Mm -hmm. So they're also a bit reluctant, like, should we do this? Or, but we also need this development to happen. So, mm. I mean, it's a hard struggle, but you need to keep fighting on because at the end of the day, if you back out, then you're all going to suffer. You know, you need to also keep them on their toes so that they know this is an important thing that needs to be done. Yeah, you, I mean, I think that the phrase is you, you're doing thankless work. It, 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 must be, it must be difficult in that kind of environment. But uh, I think most, I think anybody who's aware of the work you're doing is incredibly appreciative of that. Um, yeah. Ayaka, from your side, moving on, to, we've spoken a little bit about business and, and corporates and their responsibilities. Uh, what about the government? I think we saw a really interesting clip there. There are a number of promises, mm -hmm. as is the case with many politicians, but even policies that haven't really materialized into uh, anything meaningful. Yeah. What do you think the government should be doing? Um, this is actually a good question and it goes back to the African Climate Alliance demands. Um, what we want is the youth is um, a moratorium to be put in place for the extraction of all coal, gas and um, um, oil, coal and gas mining licenses in South mm -hmm. Africa. We also want the government to declare um, a provincial and also a national state of emergency. And we also like a mandatory um, um, climate curriculum and education to be implemented in all schools in South Africa. We'd also like the government to do a just transition to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Yeah, those are the ones at the top of my head right now. <laughs> awesome. Uh, great, great plug, but also obviously very relevant um, to just push forward what the discourse might be like. I imagine the, the first thing that the government will say is something along the lines of, you know, jobs, development, investment, particularly say around the fossil fuel industry, mm -hmm. uh, the number of people who work in that industry. Uh, what, is, what is the response to that from the ACA? I'd say um, if you want to move to a more renewable um, future, there will be jobs because like there are jobs like solar, um, solar system, enforcing them, um, hydra, um, also like renewable energy, it also needs people. So we could mm. actually take the people that we used um, in coal and people that are miners, I um, mean, educate them and train them in also um, in installing solar systems in homes and also moving to a more renewable future. Um, it's not like we'll be shutting people off and there won't be any job opportunities. There mm. are many job opportunities in renewable energy. So um, you won't really um, suffer in that aspect of coal. And in order to gain something that is big, you have to lose something essentially. Mm. So we can't just say it's going to be a 100% win-win for us, but mostly it will work out because there will be more job op opportunities when you're going and moving to a more reliable, um, renewable future, mm. essentially. Yeah. So I, I agree. I think sacrifices or at least trade-offs yeah. will have to be made. Um, I think... Uh, What's interesting about this is, I, I might be wrong about this, I think it was the CSIR, they did a study showing that for an equivalent amount of energy that's produced on renewable energy versus say coal power mm -hmm. is four times or five times jobs, job intensive um, than it would be on coal. So for each kilowatt hour you mm -hmm. produce, um, there'll be five, four or five times more jobs created. So it really is a job creator. Uh, of course, I imagine we still need, need to be cognizant of who are, who's going to get these jobs with the the coal jobs will be in Mpumalanga, um, solar jobs might be in the Northern Cape, and these will not be the same people who are benefiting and losing. And, and how we deal with that is definitely going to be a complex issue, but I completely agree that um, there's a trade-off that needs to be made, and we have to ask ourselves whether the benefits 
outweigh the costs mm -hmm. and how we can minimize those costs as well. Um, you've obviously had a very exciting week. Uh, I'll chat more about this uh, after the next clip, but uh, we'd love to hear more about what you've been up to on the international stage. So I think it's time. Today we're at the climate strike in Cape Town to witness young people and climate change activists challenge South African government to respond to the climate crisis. What do you want? Climate change! What do you want? It? Please tell us why are you here today? I am here today because I'm fighting for my future. It's a problem where we live and we just want to spread the word. Stop climate change and to make a better world. How many years do we have left until the world ends? Scientists tell us we have 11 years. 11 years. 12 years. 12 years. 11 years. Don't let 2030 be 2030. What can ordinary South Africans like you and me and other young people do at home to reduce climate change? The only thing we can do is just use our voice, come together as, as this group. As everyone that is on this earth, we need to fight for what we are standing on. To change the system, we need to be united and we need to be organized. We must change our climate change. We must change our climate change. I spoke to activist Mako Malikalaka, a winner of the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize, about her thoughts on the youth-led movement. I think with the uh, crop that is coming up now, it's brilliant. Sometimes when you're challenged by a young person, we tend to act faster. Youth around the world are also using the law to fight climate change. In the US, 21 youth activists are suing the government for violating their rights to a livable environment, which is only being made worse by this guy. All of this with the global warming and that, a lot of it's a hoax. It looks like climate lawsuits in future are going to make 2019's courtroom sagas look like an episode of Judge Judy. Oh, please. Another way to accelerate change in South Africa is by targeting the big companies directly and publicly shaming them. Shame. This is a tactic called divestment, which was famously used to great effect against companies in apartheid South Africa. So far, over a thousand institutions worldwide have taken their money out of fossil fuel companies and reinvested in renewable energy. And it's catching on in South Africa too. Cape Town is the first city in an Africa and in, in a developing country to make this commitment to divestment. Pretty much everyone in SA either has money in fossil fuels or knows someone who does. Natasha. So imagine what could happen if everyone took action tomorrow. On the other hand, some people argue that it's better to rather remain a shareholder and actively try and change things from within. I think it's taken a long time for shareholders to become cognizant of the connections between their shareholdings and the impacts of the companies yeah. that they're invested in. But once a wave like this starts, it can happen very quickly. Yes, you might be one person, but the choices you make really do matter. Really do matter. So in case you missed it, uh, this week, 16 children from around the world submitted a legal complaint about climate change to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. And amongst these children was Greta Thunberg, as you probably are aware, but more importantly, one of those children was our very own Ayaka Melitafa. So Ayaka... <laughs> tell us more about this, this milestone. Um, so basically... Um this um, petition, the United Nations petitions on the voice of the child, is basically youth and um, children all over the world taking countries to court um, for not upholding the United Nations Human Rights Charter because every single country is signed up to this and by not upholding this um, human charter rights, like you're basically ignoring um, climate change and how it's affecting us. So actually violating um, our rights as children because you are supposed to protect us um, and you are supposed to put our rights first. So um, I believe that climate change is an existential threat and it's threatening our future. So by actually signing this petition, I'm trying to make the government know that we are committed to actually trying to get you guys to change and actually support us in our fight against climate um, crisis in South Africa and all over the world. It's basically us, um, the youth of the world, every child of the world, taking the world to court for actually not protecting us and not being there for us when we need them the most. Awesome. And, and the specific countries that you, you took to court or that mm -hmm. you will be taking to court, it's, it's Argentina, Brazil, mm -hmm. Turkey, Turkey, the more. France. There, yeah, were, there were some big, yeah. big names there. Yeah, there were some big names. Awesome, awesome work. And I mean, just thinking about in the context of your career up until now, what has this journey been like for you? What has the journey been like for uh, the African Climate Alliance over the last few years? Has, has it gained momentum along with the rest of the world? What's it been like? 
Um, the African Climate Alliance basically gained momentum after the first climate march that was in March. Um, <laughs> so, like, yeah, since then, since the turnout was like 2,000 people, um, um, Ruby Samson, which is the founder of African Climate Alliance, she mm -hmm. literally came in to um, recruit us. And so I was really inspired by that. And I knew that I felt compelled um, to do more as the youth and especially as a person of color. I knew that um, since more white or privileged people uh, were taking action against climate change, it wasn't because um, it was affecting them the most. It was maybe because um, they were more climate literate and they knew how to voice out their opinions. Because even though um, people of color might be affected the worst and the severely affected by climate change, we don't really know how to vocalize and talk outside and saying um, we need more secure um, basic rights basically like the right to sanitation and water and food security and um, we don't know we don't really know what to blame and say this is mm -hmm. what's causing us um to be not able to drink um healthy water and stuff like that so i was really hoping that i'd be able to be the voice of the voiceless and just try to mobilize climate literacy um on people of color so that they can also stand up and use their voice um to talk because I do believe that they do know um, more personal experiences that are um, of being affected by climate change, and they really their stories have to be heard. I think that's what 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 was part of that was a really understated point around who this is going to affect. I think for many years people thought this was a, a privileged person's problem, yeah. and I think it came through the YouTube comment earlier when you said it's it's a first world problem or it's a second world problem when if you have a look at the images that we showed earlier of, of what Africa and South uh, America looks like in a number of years in terms of basically it becomes desert uh, at these current rates, it's really going to affect people um, who don't have social mobility, they don't have mm. the, the economic uh, uh, resources to escape their situation that are going to, to get out of that. And I know that of the 16, yeah. the 16 kids who were signing that petition, three of them were from um, I, I forget which, which island it was, but like just from a group of islands that are mm -hmm. essentially not going to exist yeah. um, because of the rising, rising sea levels. So I think that's definitely part of the narrative and part of what we were talking about earlier that needs to be, be highlighted um, that is going to affect most of us. Yeah. Great. Um, to tender on the international examples that we heard, are there any, uh, including that international example, are there are there any other international examples that come to mind in terms of legal action on the environmental side that's happening uh, around the world? And what lessons could we learn in South Africa? Could there be um, an environmental lawsuit um, at the kind of scale uh, that is, like, say, Juliana versus the United States government? Um, yeah, um, there's been quite a lot of international legal action happening, actually. Um, for example, there's a recent judgment in the US, I think it was February 2019, and it was on oil and, g oil and gas. And basically what happened is they licensed oil and gas leases to people, but they did not quantify the greenhouse gas emissions that would be emitted as a result of those of oil and gas drilling in those areas. So basically what the court said in that judgment, I think it's the Wild Earth Guardians judgment, mm -hmm. and what the court said was, you need to do a comprehensive climate change impact assessment. You need to quantify your greenhouse gas emissions. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the court stopped all the leases mm -hmm. that had been given out to people and said, this cannot go on unless you've done your, do your job. And that's just one example in the US. We do have another one in Australia. Um, it's known as the Rocky Hill Judgment, where the Australian government itself refused to give a mining right to a mining company because of climate change. That's awesome. So basically what we, what we learned from this is that around the world, countries are doing something mm. about climate change. They're stopping these developments and mm. they're becoming more aware we need to do something about it. And in South Africa, bringing it back home, we need to be able to look around the world, see what's happening and not be ignorant and try to mm. implement it in our own context. I mean, we do see our government in some instances where they're supposed to actually advocate for a low carbon economy, making decisions that mm -hmm. actually are carbon intensive. So for example, with the CR, we do have a case where a new proposed coal mine in a sensitive area in Mupumalanga what? has been authorized. And this area is sensitive, ecologically speaking, 
and also it is a declared protected area because of its mm. sensitivity mm. and at the same time there's a strategic water source area that feeds most of South Africa oh so wow. most of South Africa is reliant on that water source and they're authorizing an underground coal mine there okay. and so it's like why are you doing this so oh. we there are legal tools are available for us to actually you know take the government to account and say you cannot be making decisions like this when you can see that across the world mm. everybody is acting against climate change you know they're acting against this kind of developments that escalated instead of reducing that that's really fascinating in terms of this this coal case when can we see like the next big news when is this going to be in court <laughs> So actually, this case has been going on for years. Okay. <laughs> I joined the CR when, I mean, this year, and they've been handling that case. Okay. But, I mean, you know, the legal justice rules are quite slow. <laughs> but I, so I assume they can't progress until the, the kind of court findings are out. Yes, yeah, so particularly one of the successes we've had with the case so far was, like I said, it's a declared protected area, mm. and our national our National Environmental Management Protected Areas Act actually says that you cannot permit mining in a protected mm -hmm. area unless if the minister authorizes it. Right. And in this particular case, the minister did authorize it, but then we are saying you cannot be authorizing a coal mine in a strategic water source area. And South Africa is already a water scarce area which is case country and we are facing climate change this is just going to hit us more hard you know mm. so we did get a win there because last year the court the high court actually mm. said you know minister wasn't supposed to make such mm. a decision so it and, stopped and, and who was the minister yeah you, you have to tell um, us you have to name and shame <laughs> who the minister <laughs> was <laughs> I'm not quite sure, sure. now. Okay, we'll, we'll go back. Yeah. We'll check the receipts. We'll check the receipts. <laughs> Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, do you have any last words before I ask um, uh, Ayaka to um, wrap up? Anything else you wanted to tell us? Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, climate change is an existential problem like what mm -hmm. Ayaka was saying. We cannot be ignorant about it. Mm -hmm. We need to take action and people need to be informed about it in a way that they understand because I do know that sometimes when we talk about climate change it's mm. kind of scary and mm. when people hear scary things immediately they want to refrain from engaging in conversation so if you can find a way in which you communicate about climate change in a way that you know someone understands why it's important why they need to do something about mm. it that may actually help us to gather more people, mobilize mm. a lot of people into pressuring governments and corporates to account. Right. Awesome. Great final words. Um, <laughs> and Ayaka, I think from our side, we, we had to mention uh, Greta. Um, I just wanted to get some thoughts on how connected do you feel to her and how, do you, how connected do you feel that like, the South African, uh, African Climate Alliance movement mm -hmm. is to all the other youth movements uh, around the world? Do you guys feel like you're all striving for the same thing? Or is there really like a s very specific South African flavor to what we're trying to achieve? Um, honestly, I'm very inspired by Greta Thunberg because mm. like, she was able to mobilize such a big mm. movement in Sweden just by not going to school on Fridays and like striking outside of school. Mm. And that created the Fridays for Fuji movement. And it's a very powerful because it reached many countries and even remote places were actually joining us in the strike. And we are very connected in South Africa, but we are mm. a bit different because instead mm. of maybe like being Fridays, the future movement and striking every single Friday, mm. we do it termly every last day of term because mm. our parents work so hard to fight our education and put us in mm. school. So we do not want to disappoint them by not going to school every single Friday because that will essentially hit us hard. So, but we are supporting them. We are with them. We are fighting for the same cause, but we're just doing it termly so that we mm. can show that um, we are with you guys, but we still value our education and we do, we do want to learn, we do want to become things in life. So we cannot just strike every single Friday. Awesome. I, I mean, yes, you're, you're inspired by her, but I'm sure that, you know, there were 16 people, for example, on that law. So there are many uh, students who are behind ACA. There are many students who are going out uh, and striking uh, every term. So I think you know, I think everyone's also just feeding off each other. Of course, uh, Greta is the figurehead, but um, I'm sure from, from our side, Politically Aware is going to, to basically set up a campaign to uh, rebrand Greta as South of uh, Sweden's Ayaka uh, Melitafa. So I think 
on that note, super inspirational, we're going to go to some Q&A, going to hand over to Zippo and uh, see what questions the internet and the live audience is going to throw at us. Great. Right. So as we promised, we'd ask the um, audience to please give us some questions and I'll come to the audience afterwards. Um, so I have a question from Joanne Horn. Can you give us some examples of decisions that a person on the Cape Flats might make when they should be considering climate change issues? Mm. What's, what's <laughs> the take that? Um, Ayaka, you want to go? Um, what I know um, about the Cape Flats is um, there's a lot of gangsterism and violence. So um, I feel like people there will be um, a bit mm. naive or very arrogant when it comes to climate change because they'll be like, how am I going to look at that when I'm busy um, trying to be safe and I'm trying to protect my children's lives? So it's very important to me um, to fight for that first before I go to climate change, not knowing how much it's actually been af affecting um, the Cape Flats region because of the floods and stuff like that. So it's very important um, for people in Cape Flats to essentially fight against climate change and not just focus on the more pressing pressing issues because these are ex existential threats and they will um, mm. affect us wildly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, all right. Thank you, yeah. Ayaka. So um, we have a question from Yashu Tana from YouTube. Thank you mm. for that. Um, the question is for the legal side. Mm. Why are new developments and investments in fossil fuel plants still happening? Why is it still profitable for people to invest in unclean energy? I think that's the question that we are all asking. Mm. You know, as the CR, we also like, mm. why are you authorizing such developments when we are supposed to be moving to a less carbon intensive economy? But I guess the question, the quick answer to that is lack of political will. Government keeps promising, but they're just not delivering. You know, they talk a lot about how they want to things to change, how they want to act on climate change. But what we see is the opposite. So it's basically government not sticking to its word. And I think, you know, if we unite against, if you unite against them and actually say, you know, you guys, it's time to, you know, walk the mm. talk, then maybe we can see some change. Mm. Then just, uh, just to add to that, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, not from the legal side, but it's definitely confusing, particularly when it comes to coal, um, to want to invest in that because it is becoming increasingly more expensive to extract coal mm. and becoming like, less competitive against renewable energy. Mm. Um, so there's a question from Alicia Williams. Alicia says, as a South African living in London for the last nine months, I've noticed that climate change and everyone's individual role in preventing and reversing these effects are everywhere. You feel a little bombarded at work, on the tube, at the grocery store. Why are these conversations, information not happening in South Africa? Where are the ads, the hashtags, school projects? Well, I think that's why we're here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, yeah. That <laughs> I think we're trying. I think we're, we're trying to start a movement. Um, I, I speak for myself when I say I haven't seen, I haven't felt the, the the vibe in South Africa change the way it has in 2019. Uh, and I think a lot of it does have to do with, um, you know, March and March, um, you know, change climate change uh, that 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 happened this year that led by the ACA. I think the, obviously the global conversation has changed as well. We have Greta uh, Thunberg as well the, as the. Green New Deal, which I think was proposed in about mm -hmm. February this year. And, you know, when it's a big news in America, it tends to become global news and find out what exactly that's about. And I think that's all added up. And now we're sitting in September during Climate Action Week and, you know, Greta's in the news again. And I think it's, it is on people's minds uh, increasingly. Okay. I'm not sure if you guys have anything to, to add. No, I actually said it all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. I'm back. Um, so I think from that point, I just want to read a comment. And I know we're not supposed to read comments, but this is a very important one. So it's again from Yashutana on YouTube. He says that I believe empathy is a factor that could mm. contribute to the awareness. Mm. It's easy to not believe how pressing this is when we're sitting in an air-conditioned office versus manual mm. labor art today in Cape Town. Mm. Mm. Agreed. Yeah. Right, so mm. I'm going to come back to the audience since you all, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's now time for you guys to actually say. So does anyone have a question for 
me or the <laughs> guests rather because i wouldn't be able to answer at all all right okay should i come through to you My name is Wesley and I'm also from the Center for Environmental Rights. And I have a comment um, leading on from the comment that you just read about empathy. I think it's really important in the environmental space, you know, to have empathy to everyone and for everyone, whether they know or they don't know, because that's how we're able to share the information. So, for example, when we talk about climate change and a just transition, it's also, we can also emphasize that the just transition is not just a transition from coal to renewable energies, but it also involves social protection. So when we move to this new place where we're using renewable energy, we want government to reskill workers that are currently working in carbon intensive industries. We want government to change our curriculums so we're more prepared to enter society that requires us to work in spaces where we don't use coal. We want government to think about our transport systems. How are you going to change our transport systems so that they don't emit as much carbon and so that we have access to these transport systems as people that live very far. I mean, we know South Africa has a big issue with like its spatial planning. And so these are the type of questions that we can bring into the conversation about a just transition so everyone feels involved and included and as if they will also be protected when we move. Oh, wow, thank you very much for that. Awesome. Any other question for me? Sorry, the guest guys, not me. <laughs> Um, I think I just want to comment on the just transition part. I remember I was having a conversation with my family and they were like, what's going to happen to all the people um, with their jobs? And I said, just transition. And they were like, you always have an answer for everything. <laughs> and I think, and I know that was funny, but I think that's the problem sometimes we have as South Africans. We always want to rebuttal things mm -hmm. without actually having evidence and actually researching about yeah. things. But anyway, so um, Aman, any last comments? Any last comments from you, Ayaka? Tatenda about just transition, now that we've mentioned it? Because I think it's actually a very important topic. Maybe yeah. we can explain what it is just quickly. Um, actually, I'm still at grips. I'm still mm. grappling with the concept myself because mm. I'm not quite sure what it looks like. And I don't mm. think mm. I've actually seen a group of people who really know what it looks like. Mm. And I also think part of the anxiety around this just transition is also about the fact that there's not much information about what it's going to look like. Yeah. So I think um, the best thing we can do is maybe come together. Everybody who's going to mm. be affected, sit on the same table and design what this tr just transition is going to be. Because then when you go out there and try to talk to people about it, it will be easier. So that's my immediate thoughts about it now. Yeah. Mm. All right, so I think that's very important because sometimes it's just black and white. But what does it actually mean mm -hmm. in real life? Any more questions from the audience? Or oh, no? Wow, guys. Oh, wow. Yay. Oh, there's now two. <laughs> awesome. I'll start the side. Okay. People, why don't we bring them down to the front here? Hi, I'm Jess. Um, so you actually started the, the panel with saying it's going to be good because we know where we're going with climate change. Mm. But um, one of the biggest things we get mm. from decision makers is that climate change is actually quite uncertain. Mm. There are very clear trends, warming mm. and things. But for example, pre precipitation and rainfall mm. is very, very hard to predict. So just um, maybe some advice on how we overcome that uncertainty, which is kind of the excuse being given to us by decision makers and that they're unable to act because they don't have the clear information. Mm. I mean, so the example I think that comes to mind could be Cape Town's drought. I think the new normal from a decision-making point of view from government is that we can't really toe the line and make decisions the way we used to, particularly when it comes to infrastructure spend. We actually have to build in redundancy. We actually have to build in excess supply because of this uncertainty. Uh, unfortunately, the kind of, you know, the error margins that we, we built in previously uh, weren't sufficient uh, because it was almost like cost optimal. I think we need to return to uh, what we think the, the mandate of governments are versus corporations, which is not necessarily to, um, in this case, ensure that every rand is used like has a marginal benefit at the end. Of course, you have to use every rand uh, smartly, but understanding that the chief mandate, for example, in that situation, is to ensure that there is adequate supply, um, and not to try and work it out in such a way that we can, um, uh, you know, optimize uh, earnings or return over um, infrastructure spend over a number of years. I think that's like that's like just one example. I think of how the the psyche needs to change in terms of how governments make decisions, which is in the face of uncertainty, you should be really conservative and prudent because the downside is 
like something we, we can't um, basically take a chance on. Yeah. All right. Um, Thank you, Aman. So we'll be yeah. taking the last question. Um, yes. Fortunately, it's a comment and not a question. I really just wanted to give a massive shout out um, to this platform because I think there definitely has been a gap. Yes, <laughs> shout out. <laughs> There definitely has been a gap in how the media reports and discusses climate change, climate impacts, and all the different nuances around it. And most importantly, it's really um, refreshing to see young people taking on the issue as their own. You know, in, you know, people are really tired of just having like the old guard coming in and telling us this is how we need to live, this is how we need to operate, and corporates taking ownership of that narrative. It's really impressive to see like young people are taking ownership of this issue young people know what it is that um, they are faced with and the future they are faced with and you know this has become their struggle so I think as people who are a little bit older than the younger generation our role is to really be like super supportive and to really like embrace these new voices that are coming out and most importantly to take them seriously thanks mm -hmm. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you. Aman, I'll give it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Zipo. Um, and thank you for all those questions. I think they were really well thought out uh, and the comments were great as well. Um, I think a few reflections from my side on the show and the, the climate series as a whole is that, as we mentioned, and as has come through the comments, there's a lot of news out there. And rather than summarize and repackage what's already out there, here at Politically Aware, we're trying to separate that signal from that noise. It's one of the issues, or well, climate change is one of those issues that we feel hasn't been covered nearly as well as it should be in mainstream media. And we are extremely excited and proud to have created this climate change content that speaks to uh, our South African audience. So I'd like to thank uh, Tatenda and Ayaka for joining me because I think we have, we have actually moved the conversation a little bit forward in terms of the youth and climate action in South Africa. And that is it for tonight. It went by very quickly. Um, I'd like to first of all say thank you to our amazing audience. You guys were absolutely phenomenal. Thank you, of course, to our online audience for the comments, the questions, for engaging and watching. We really do appreciate it. And of course, thank you to our guest, Ayaka, Aman, and Tatenda. Absolutely amazing. And thank you to the crew. Oh, wow, I hear there's a clap. Um, and thank you to the crew, of course, for helping out today. And thank you once again. Please remember to stay woke, stay away. South Africa is not only the biggest carbon polluter in Africa, but it's actually the 14th biggest in the world. Very disappointing.